Goodwill and the Ad Council. You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Greetings and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke, and as a reminder, you are watching and listening to, excuse me, you are listening to Words on Film on bostonfreeradio.com, watching Words on Film on Somerville Community Access Television or some community TV station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast, and to them I say thank you. Or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. And interestingly enough, I have five movies to review for you for this show, which is usually the number for which I strive, but interestingly enough, first of all, I actually saw six movies this week, and I'm going to have to save one of my reviews for next week, and it was kind of tough to decide which one I was going to hold off, but also, there was a crucial piece of Oscar news that hit the news media this past week that I really wanted to discuss, but unfortunately, I'm not going to have time, or at least uh, not that I know of. But first, I'm going to start off with my normal segment, which is What's Topping the Box Office? These are the top 10 highest grossing films of this past weekend. And to start it off is a movie that hit number one that I did not expect to debut at number one. I thought that Mission Impossible... Fallout would hold on to the number one spot for the third week in a row, considering how popular, critically and commercially, a movie that is. But The Meg took the number one spot this past weekend, grossing $45.4 million at the U.S. box office and $146.9 million worldwide, against a budget of $130 to $178 million, somewhere in that range. It actually is amazing that The Meg cost that much, but if you actually saw the movie and saw the special effects, you could probably see why. I, that is one of the five movies I'll be reviewing for you for this show, but that will be later on. But as of right now, The Meg is not a hit yet here in the States. Around the world, it is a potentially tentative hit. But again, not a certified hit by any stretch of the imagination. That may change by next week, at least worldwide. Mission Impossible Fallout, in contrast, is number two at the box office, outseated from the number one spot for the first time in its run, although that was inevitable. I just didn't think it would be this soon. But Mission Impossible Fallout, against a budget of $178 million, has so far grossed $161.3 million here in the States and $436.9 million worldwide. And what I forgot to mention was this weekend it grossed $19.4 million. So here in the States, it's actually not a hit yet, not even a tentative hit, but around the world it is already a certified hit. So it goes to show you the increasing international star power of Tom Cruise. It is not faded yet, and it probably won't fade until Tom Cruise is dead, but then again, I could be proven wrong in that instance as well. Christopher Robin, the Disney movie, debuted at number two last week. This week in... This weekend, it's number three at the box office, having grossed an even $13 million. And by even, I mean it grossed $13 million and nothing more or less in the decimal place. Against a budget of $75 million, Christopher Robin has so far grossed 50, that's five zero point five million million here in the States, and $62.9 million worldwide, which is pretty good, but it's still not a hit yet here in the States or around the world. If anything, I thought it would actually be doing better internationally given the international appeal of Winnie the Pooh, especially in Great Britain, but apparently that is not the case. So moving on with the list, there is actually an interesting anecdote that I heard about so one of my listeners who saw the movie Christopher Robin for herself, she actually said that there was a kid in the audience who, after the movie was over, said, these are two hours of my life I'll never get back. That was not the way I felt when I saw Christopher Robin, but I guess that's the way some people are feeling. I don't really know what to account for what <laughs> caused that reaction. But anyway, moving on with the list because I don't have a lot of time. Slender Man debuted at number four at the box office this weekend, having grossed $11.4 million in the United States against a budget ranging from $10 to $28 million, somewhere in that range. Now, Slender Man may be a tentative hit, but 
I don't know, but it's off to a relatively good start. It will probably have to make $28.1 million or more to be considered a tentative hit, and it may or may not achieve that goal. Black Klansman is number five at the box office, debuting just like Slender Man and The Meg this week, having made a pretty impressive $10.8 million in its opening weekend, and that is against a budget of $15 million, and that ten point eight is only in, in the United States. So Black Klansman is not a hit yet, but it probably will be by next week. We'll have to see. The Spy Who Dumped Me is number six in the box office this weekend, sliding actually quite a bit from number three last week, having grossed $6.5 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $40 million, The Spy Who Dumped Me has so far grossed $24.4 million here in the States and $31.7 million worldwide, which means it's neither hit here in the States or around the world yet, and it's off to a very rough start. Last week it was in the top five. This week it isn't. We may be looking at a bomb on our hands, but then again, I could be proven wrong in that instance. Mamma Mia, here we go again. In its fourth week in release, is doing pretty well. It's number seven this week, sliding from number four last week. But it grossed $5.9 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $75 million, Mamma Mia, here we go again, has so far grossed $103.9 million here in the States and $281.9 million worldwide, which means that people around the world love their ABBA music. Here in the States, it's a a tentative hit, but around the world it is, as implied by my previous statement, a certified hit. The Equalizer 2 is also doing pretty well for itself. It is number 8, sliding from number 5 last week, having grossed $5.4 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $62 million, The Equalizer 2 has so far grossed $89.6 million here in the States and $99.7 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the States and around the world. We may not see The Equalizer 2 become a certified hit anytime soon, which is too bad because it's a really good movie, but it's doing pretty well for itself so far. Hotel Transylvania 3 Summer Vacation is number 9 at the box office this weekend, having grossed $5.2 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $80 million, Hotel Transylvania 3 Summer Vacation has so far grossed $147 million here in the States and $379.6 million worldwide. 180 over 111, and I had a stroke. I couldn't speak or walk. 150 over 90, and I had a stroke. This is what high blood pressure sounds like. You might not feel its symptoms, but the results from a stroke are far from silent. Get back on your treatment plan or talk with your doctor to create a plan that works for you. Go to loweryourhpp.org. I had to tell everything's changed. Brought to you by the American Stroke Association, American Medical Association, and the Ad Council. Listen to She Likes It Heavy on Tuesdays at 10 p.m. Eastern on BostonFreeRadio.com. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. So I actually did not finish my segment, What's Topping the Box Office, from the previous break, but I can tell you this. Starting from number nine, Hotel Transylvania 3 Summer Vacation, I can tell you that that movie is a tentative hit here in the States, very, very close to being a certified hit, but around the world it has already reached certified hit status, which probably means we might might see a Hotel Transylvania 4 somewhere in the horizon. They'll keep making them until one of them is just bad. That's my prediction. But finally, Ant-Man and the Wasp is number 10 at the box office, sliding from number 7 last week, having grossed $4.1 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $162 million, Ant-Man and the Wasp has so far grossed 
203.6 million dollars here in the states and 449.2 million dollars worldwide which means it is a tentative hit here in the states better a tentative hit than no hit at all and around the world it is a certified hit but it hasn't grossed nearly as much as either black panther or avengers infinity war black panther grossed 1.3 billion dollars at the u.s box office when it was in theaters and avengers infinity war which just came out on dvd and blu-ray grossed a total of two billion dollars worldwide two billion and change a couple of million in there so ant-man and the wasp didn't catch up to them it was not expected to do so but still it hasn't harmed the marvel cinematic universe in any way shape or form so now that i've done the complete what's topping the box office now time to get into my review of my first movie which is the first movie i'm going to review for you for this show is the meg the meg has just been released it is a shark movie which probably inevitably compares to jaws but i guess the difference between the meg and jaws is that the meg is a much 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 bigger shark uh, Meg is short for Megalodon. In fact, calling it the Meg I thought was a kind of a bad idea because the Meg kind of sounds like a romantic comedy to me ab about a woman whose name is Meg who is happy to be single. And because of that, she names herself the Meg. I don't know. That, that's just my in my opinion, but a megalodon is a 75 foot long shark or 23 meters long, which makes it almost as long as a blue whale. In other words, this is a very, very big shark. Does this shark actually exist in real life? Uh, it did, but it's an extinct species of shark that is uh, believed to have lived approximately 23 million to 2.6 million years ago. So during the Mesozoic era, basically. So the movie, as hard as this is to believe, is actually based on a 1997 novel called Meg, a Novel of Deep Terror that was written by Steve Alton. And this is a series of books that had several sequels, and it followed the underwater adventures of a Navy deep sea diver named Jonas Taylor, who in this movie is played by Jason Statham. Them. And interestingly enough, Jason Statham alone would be enough to bring moviegoers into a film, at least I would think so, especially given the success of such movies that Jason Statham has been in, not just the ones that have been directed by Guy Ritchie, like Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels, but other ones like the Fast and the Furious films and the Transporter trilogy. But his name is actually in very teeny tiny letters on the poster for The Meg. But in, other, but in any event, so the movie actually does not introduce us to Jonas Taylor right off the bat. It actually introduces us to a series of marine biologists who are being financed by a an arrogant billionaire by the name of Jack Morris, who in this movie is played with comic relief by Rain Wilson. And he is actually funding this deep sea dive, and there are several marine biologists who go underneath a very deep crevice of water that was is believed to be in this movie deeper than the Marianas Trench. And the Marianas Trench is so far the most recorded, the deepest part of the ocean, of any ocean. But according to this movie, that was just believed before the advanced technology that they have in this film. So these deep sea divers delve into this new aquatic deep um, deep sea environment which ha houses a number of various types of fish that were not believed to have existed previously including this thought to be extinct 75 foot long megalodon and of course when the megalodon comes into the picture the the deep sea divers who are also marine biologists are in deep trouble until they recruit Jonas Taylor to rescue these deep sea divers. And interestingly enough, you would think that the three people who are in this tiny pod in the deepest part of the ocean, 
according to this movie, would be stressing out about how much deep trouble they're in. And once Jonas Taylor, again Jason Statham's character, comes in to rescue them, there isn't a lot of relief on the faces of these marine biologists. I know if I was down in in the depths of this ocean and somebody came and rescued me, I would be kissing this person even if it was a guy because my life would be saved. Uh, that, that's one of the main inconsistencies with, with this film, The Meg, or at least uh, a movie that really lacks in character development where it could have elaborated upon some of these characters, made them more interesting, and that's including Jason, Sta- uh, Jason Statham's character, Jonas Taylor. As a matter of fact, there are... Several points where you think that Jason Statham's character is going to be um, getting a love interest. And in fact, there are three particularly beautiful women in this movie. There's one whose character's name is Suyin Zhang. And she's played by a lovely actress by the name of Lee Bingbing. And there's also a woman who is... um, Jason Statham's character's ex-wife, which is kind of a uh, kind of a bombshell to throw at you. Her name is Lori, and she's played by Jessica McNamee. And there's also another beautiful woman in this movie named Jax Hurd, who's played by Ruby Rose of Orange is the New Black fame. But even though this movie has very special effects, the character development was pretty weak. It gets my reading of a checkout because on the big screen it's very fun to watch, but... I don't think it's particularly memorable and won't be remembered even a year from now. I'm a 40-year-old man that walked in there to get his high school diploma. It was very hard for me, but Miss Araceli, she gave me direction. At age 47, Marco finished his high school diploma. 50% of getting your high school diploma is walking through those doors. The other 50% is doing the work. No one gets a diploma alone. If you're thinking of finishing your high school diploma, you have help. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. That's finishyourdiploma.org. Brought to you by the Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ad Council. Hey, 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 it's Genevieve, a.k.a. Miss Fab 617. And it's your girl, Crystal, a.k.a. The Crystal Lens. We're coming to you from our new show called Boston Boston Come Come Through. Through. We'll be bringing you the latest and greatest things happening in and around Boston. We'll be talking what? Black-owned businesses, social events, what? what? And the Black Experience. How's that sound, Genevieve? I love it. Dig it. Tune in every Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio. Boston, come through. Come listen. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Slender Man, which is the long-awaited movie, I guess amongst horror fans, that is based on a fictional supernatural character that originated as a creepypasta internet meme. Now, for those of you who don't know what creepypastas are, it's a weird term, and I've Every every time I hear this term, I, I sometimes think to myself, what the hell does this have to do with pasta? It doesn't. But it's a horror-related legend or image that has been copied and pasted around the internet. So it's an urban legend for the internet age. And it's actually a portmanteau of the words creepy and copy pasta. Copy pasta is a movie, uh, excuse me, is a is an internet phenomenon that comes from the computer functions copy and paste. And apparently copy copy pasta is where somebody copies and pastes a block of text i didn't even know that term existed but there you go so slender man is a creepy pasta internet meme that was developed in 2009 by somebody by the name of eric nudson and very much like the creators of the blair witch project uh eric nudson created this character almost as something that existed hundreds of years ago, but never really actually existed. But since its inception in 2009, it has pretty much taken the internet by storm in some good ways, like creating a video game out of it, and also in some really, really morbidly bad ways. Particularly in 2014, where there was a near-fatal fa- stabbing of a 12-year-old girl in Waukesha, Wisconsin. And if you ever see the Dateline story of this, it will make you sick. Apparently, it's, it's almost like something out of Heavenly Creatures, which was also based on a true story. But Slender Man probably should not have been released or even 
conceived as a movie based on that that stabbing that happened to that poor 12-year-old girl. But I, I guess that was four years ago, and we should maybe move on. Maybe that doesn't automatically make it bad territory for a, a film adaptation. But in any event, Slender Man, as far as horror movies go, is not particularly impressive. And it basically leans on horror movie cliches we've seen dozens of times before. Once we see four friends in high school who are who are talking amongst themselves in the hallway about the slender man and then they have a slumber party together and they get on the internet and they get to a website that says do not watch this video they click the video anyway you know where this is going to go there are there are the same kinds of ups and downs as other films where there are vulnerable teenagers who delve into witchcraft or whatever to to basically playfully dive into a legend they don't believe nor do they they fully grasp the power of and so on and so forth this movie is not only predictable it also really isn't scary as a matter of fact once the slender man comes into the picture he just looks goofy uh, he looks like some kind of college animated graphic design uh, rough draft and you you don't really care about the girls in this movie you don't care about what the slender man does you don't exactly know once slender man kidnaps children what exactly he's going to do to them afterwards of course you could extrapolate what what he does for them yourself but it's much better to actually show some of the really horrid and disturbing things that slender man does to his victims rather than just having him show up and look intimidating and there's also a, what i felt to be a really cop-out subplot to this where or i wouldn't exactly call it a subplot but part of the slender man mythos in other words slender man either kidnaps children or takes the children lets them go and the child isn't the same afterwards according to legend so what maybe a, a, a sequel would better answer this but the truth of the matter is after such a really poor movie i'm not interested in a sequel as a matter of fact one of the four teenagers in this movie is played by an actress named joey king who is a very good actress she's been in a, a number of interesting films um which have been directed by a number of noteworthy directors including christopher nolan she was in uh she had a prominent role in the dark knight rises as a young talia al ghul who was the character of marion contillard it, or maybe i gave a little bit away there but uh forgive me for that but she's also been in movies like oz the great and powerful white house down but unfortunately as far as her track record for movies go she was the lead in last year's Wish Upon, which I declared one of the worst films of 2017 for good reason. So here Joey King is in another film which is cliche ridden and when, when it comes down to it, not particularly scary. And that really comes as a disappointment because Slender Man has so many possibilities. He obviously has a following on the internet, but maybe the problem with this movie is it came nine years after the inception of Slender Man. Maybe they should have focused on making the movie first and then used the Slender Man creepypasta as a way of advertising the movie, very much like the Blair Witch Project did advertising its movie. But then again, the Blair Witch Project, <clears throat> excuse me, the Blair Witch Project came at a time when people had the internet, but the internet wasn't as useful for advertising movies as it is today. So that was a whole different kind of uh, marketing campaign that hasn't that hadn't actually been traveled down before. So Slender Man 
its biggest weakness is not only did it come too little too late, but it's not particularly original. And by this time, Slender Man has already become a joke, very much like Freddy Krueger and Jason in their seventh, eighth, or ninth movie. And Slender Man gets my rating of a flunk out. The the special effects are terrible. The acting is bad. The movie in terms of its story is very cliche and this movie does not add anything to the horror movie genre or the slender man's legacy as it is right now dad this is fun i didn't think i like kayaking well i'm glad you enjoyed it but i think it's time to head back in okay can we come back sure hey be careful getting out of the boat it's a kayak dad <laughs> i'm gonna return the kayak Can we walk home? How about a taxi? It's a short fare from your neighborhood to your naturehood. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a neighborhood park or green space near you. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the U.S. Forest Service. This is Alan Patterson. I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras in many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations, including prog, psychedelia, garage, and punk, Motown, old school R&B, soul, blues, jazz, gospel, folk, old school country, zydeco, all music New Orleans, rockabilly, bluegrass, world music, comedy, poetry, and spoken word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to review is one I've been looking forward to for a very long time, particularly because Spike Lee is one of my favorite directors, and whether it's a good movie or a bad movie he does, it, it always, I always look forward to seeing what he comes up with. And Black Klansman is probably going to be the movie that's considered his true comeback. The, the truth of the matter is he hasn't gone anywhere uh, but this is probably his most evenly balanced movie and probably his most compelling movie in years this is a true story about Ron Stallworth who is an African American police officer who, it, who, who first began his career in Colorado and when he rose from the ranks of being a file clerk in the Colorado Police Department to becoming a detective, he successfully managed to infiltrate the local Ku Klux Klan chapter and become the head of the local chapter, despite being, you know, black. <laughs> so this is absolutely a true story, although like many movies based on true stories, it takes some liberties with the events that transpire. But the the role of Ron Stahl's, Stallworth, excuse me, is played in this movie by John David Washington, who is not exactly a newcomer, but this is his first lead role in a film, and he does a fantastic job in this movie. In fact, he's actually had some extensive acting experience before. He's uh, actually a regular on a TV show called Ballers, which I believe is on HBO. I could be, yep, uh, confirmed. It is on HBO, and that's a show that's actually starring Dwayne The Rock Johnson. He's also had uh, prominent supporting roles in movies like Love Beats Rhymes, Monsters and Men, and the movie Monster from earlier this year. Uh, this movie, Monster, 
actually is a movie that I have not seen, but it's not related to the Charlize Theron film from 2003. But another interesting thing to note about John David Washington, and even though I, I hate to say that this person is related to that person, you know, as if to discredit them, John David Washington is Denzel Washington's oldest son. And just because Spike Lee has directed Denzel Washington in four leading roles, Mo Better Blues, Malcolm X, He Got Game, and Inside Man, I don't believe that nepotism played any part in John David Washington receiving a lead role in, in this film. I think John David Washington is a very talented actor and earns his place in this film. He does a fantastic job in here as Ron Stallworth. And there are a number of great scenes in here with John David Washington. And I think he works very well off of just about anyone he's opposite in acting in this film. For instance, his his supervisor, Chief Bridges, who's played by veteran character actor Robert John Burke, as well as his his partner, Flip Zimmerman, who is played in this movie by Adam Driver, and also his love interest in the film, Patrice Dumas, who's played by another lovely young actress by the name of Laura Harrier, who's probably best known for her role as Liz, who's Spider-Man or Peter Parker's love interest in last year's Spider-Man Homecoming. She is a very beautiful actress, and in this film, she proves herself not to be more than just a pretty face. So, you're probably asking yourself, how does a black man infiltrate the KKK? Well, in this age of social media, it's it's virtually impossible. But in the days before computers and even cell phones, when people had um, those those dial um, those dial phones, where you click. You push the number nine and you have to wait for the dial to stop rotating and so on and so forth. Ron Stallworth actually pulled that off pretty easily, or not easily, but uh, with a little bit of maneuvering, but it would have been much harder to do today. And his partner, Adam Driver, served as his, um, I guess you could say, what's the word I'm looking for? Avatar, as he went in to actually investigate the KKK and its members. And there are a number of great supporting performances in this movie, some of which are are short. Like, for instance, uh, Corey Hawkins, best known for playing Dr. Dre in Straight Outta Compton, makes a great appearance in this movie as Stokey Carmichael, who, by the early 70s, goes by his African name, Kwame Ture. But I also really liked the the performances of just about everyone in this movie who played a Klansman, including um, Michael... Oh, I'm sorry. Um... I, I should have looked this up beforehand. Um, the The cast list on IMDb right now is according to orders of appearances, but um, there's a number of Klansmen who do really good jobs in this movie, including uh, Jasper Pankinen, who is a Scandinavian actor who plays Felix Kendrickson. And for somebody to play a neo-Nazi or a member of the Klan, um, the Jasper P- Pankinen is, is actually uh, Finnish. I, I said Scandinavian, but more specifically, he's from Finland. But yeah, to be a member or, or to be somebody who plays a, an American neo-Nazi or a KKK member, it helps to be Jewish and or from another country. And I thought that Jasper Pankinen did really well in his role in this film. I also really liked Ryan Eggel who played Walter Breachway and Paul Walter Hauser um, also does well in this movie as a guy who's known as Ivanhoe, who's probably the most redneck of the KKK members. I don't think he's Jewish, but um, he's one of the only American actors playing a KKK member. And also, I was really impressed by Topher Grace as David Duke. Not only did he look the part, but he acted really well in this film. And there's a great 
uh, supporting performance here by Harry Belafonte, who makes a very brief but memorable appearance as a man by the name of Jerome Turner, who might be real. I didn't do the research there, but Black Klansman is one of my favorite films of the year so far, and it gets my rating of a knockout. It is expertly directed, superbly acted by just about everyone in it, and tells an amazing story that happens to be true. And it ends really well, too, in a way that I won't reveal. Hi, we're the Goo Goo Dolls. We're fortunate that our daughters have what they need to grow and learn. But that isn't the case for nearly 13 million kids in the U.S. that struggle with hunger. Childhood hunger is a heartbreaking reality that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste and provides it to families and children in need. You can help kids in need in your community by visiting feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. From the birthplace of the American Revolution, Boston, Massachusetts. It's all about Facebook. Facebook. BostonFreeRadio.com. Diane Wong here announcing a new radio program. Let's talk about race. From our beginnings as a white supremacist society to our current existence as a white supremacist society. Race is a topic that affects us all, and yet we have difficulty talking about it. Why is race so difficult? Why can't we talk openly about white supremacy? Why don't we like to talk about white privilege? Why is internalized oppression shrouded in mystery? What about lynching? What about gerrymandering and the current Black Lives Matters debate? We'll talk about all of it. Come and join us Thursdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Let's talk about race. Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Dog Days. And this is a movie that did get a wide release, but as you might remember from my segment, What's Topping the Box Office, from earlier in the show, this movie was not in the top 10. Actually, I did some research, and it was number 12 at the box office, which is not off to the best start. But this is a movie I went into not expecting very much. Of course, when I heard it was a romantic comedy, comedy and it involved dogs. I wasn't exactly thrilled about it, but when I actually saw the film, I was actually pretty impressed by how good it was and certainly how charming it was. And Dog Days does not tell one story, or at least not one romantic comedy. It actually follows a group of interconnected people in Los Angeles who are brought together by their lovable canine counterparts. So this is kind of like if Nancy Myers and Robert Altman got together to make a movie. It would probably look like this. It certainly has elements of both, probably leaning a little bit more towards Nancy Myers or Nora Ephron than it does Robert Altman or Paul Thomas Anderson or anyone else who does those ensemble films very well. But this movie was actually a lot more charming and a lot funnier than I anticipated. It's directed by Ken Marino, and Ken Marino has done some a lot of acting. He's best known for being a member of the... the comedy troupe The State, who had a cult show on MTV for quite some time. And he's acted in a number of movies, including Wet Hot American Summer, Wanderlust, and um, other films. But um, in terms of directing, he's directed a couple of films... He's, he's directed mostly TV series. He made his directorial debut of a feature film last year with How to Be a Latin Lover, which wasn't a great film, but it did actually showcase Eugenio Derbez's comic talents adequately well, but not as good as this year's Overboard did. But Dog Days, I think, out of two films, is Ken Marino's best directorial debut, or rather, b- best director best directorial film to date. That's what I was trying to say. (laughs) I will edit that out for the podcast. But there are a number of stories being told in this film. There's one of a woman by the name of Elizabeth, who's played by Nina Dobrev, who is a lovely young uh, actress, who is actually um, a host of a very successful morning TV show in Los Angeles. And because it's in Los Angeles, it looks a lot better than most local morning TV shows. And she reluctantly gets a co-host whose name, if you'll 
Excuse me. Now, okay. Basically, she gets a charming co-host who is a former member of the Los Angeles Rams, and he, uh, at first, it, it does that kind of romantic comedy thing where Nina Dobrev, despite being dropped at gorgeous, is actually cheated on by her boyfriend. So she is disheartened and not exactly thrilled to get a um, a, a co-host like um, her, <laughs> like the one she gets, whose whose name I actually can't find right now because I probably should have written the the names here before I before I started the show but in any event you know there's a little bit of fighting between them a lot of resentment and then eventually they they find something in common which happens to be as the title of the film suggests their their love for dogs as they each have one there's also another subplot involving Two parents who are played by Eva Longoria and Rob Corddry, who <laughs> yeah, Rob Corddry kind of hit the jackpot in terms of uh, who who he married in this movie, but they are two parents who are struggling to conceive their own child, so they adopt a cute little eight year old who still is kind of baffled by the the concept of being adopted by two loving parents and doesn't talk very much, but then they find common ground in a dog that she finds that has apparently lost his way. And it turns out that that dog is actually owned by a lonely old man by the name of Ron, uh, who, who's, the, the old man is played by Ron Cephas Jones, who actually develops a friendship with a local young kid who's in summer school, whose name is Tyler, who's played by a young actor named Finn Wolfhard. And the two of them get together to find their the, the man's missing dog, uh, even though he's in good care. And there are also a number of other subplots, too. There, I, I think there are a, little, a few too many characters to name. There's a cute uh, barista by the name of Tara, who's played by Vanessa Hudgens. And there's also a not particularly attractive guy named Garrett, who's played by John Bass. Uh, John Bass probably, unfortunately, being best known for Baywatch, um, which was a terrible movie. Worst film of 2016, according to me. But in this film, he actually is a lot more charming, particularly because he doesn't try to be Seth Rogen like he did in Baywatch. In instead, he he actually develops a a, a personality that he is probably better accustomed to and i think the last subplot involves a slacker by the name of dax who's played by adam pally who is taking care of his sister's dog after his sister gives birth to twins and really can't handle a dog at the moment and there's a love story that happens with him too so the some of the love stories are a little bit predictable but i think all the stories in this movie are really sweet. Plus, I did mention Vanessa Hudgens a little while earlier, and Vanessa Hudgens has been acting for quite some time. She, of course, she came to international fame from her co-starring role in the high school mu musical movies, which I haven't seen, and her career hasn't been as illustrious as Zac Efron's has. I think Zac Efron has officially solidified himself as an A-lister. Vanessa Hudgens isn't there yet, but if, if a lot of people see this movie, I think that might change because Vanessa Hudgens was lovely in this film. Not only did she look great, but I think she also acted really well in this film. This could be her best acting role to date. So I only have about 30 seconds left. I really have to wrap it up about Dog Days. It actually gets my rating of a knockout. Yes, there are stories in here that are kind of predictable, but the dogs are really cute. The... Humans in this film act really well, and Ken Marino, like his state counterparts, Michael Showalter and David Wayne, as a director, finds beauty in the awkward moments, and that makes this movie all the sweeter. And I wish more people would see it. Para mucha gente del país, tener un día de tranquilidad con la familia es difícil. 
Le pasa a Salvador, un taxista de Nueva York con dos hijas. Trabajo alrededor de 9 a 10 horas diarias. Pero hay algo que muchos papás no saben, y es que el bosque, ese respiro que necesitan, está realmente cerca. Yo considero que esto es buena vida, estar aquí. Tu familia también puede disfrutar de la tranquilidad del bosque a menos de 90 minutos. Entra en descubreelbosque.org y encuentra el bosque más cercano. El bosque, más cerca de lo que crees. Un mensaje del Servicio Forestal de los Estados Unidos y el Ad Council. I love those real six They're the ones that move me A thinly blown Neurotic tone Intensify and groove me All this and more on Unpacked Music Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The last movie I'm going to be reviewing for you for this show is Blind Spotting. This is a movie that debuted at a number of film festivals, including probably most notably this year's Sundance Film Festival. And I'm going to tell you right now, just very briefly before I get to the movie, I am going to try my darndest to go to 2019 Sundance Film Festival because I have been missing so many movies but that's another story for another time blind spotting is a film very much like sorry to bother you that is a little weird but blind spotting is a little bit more grounded in reality than sorry to bother you but it's also um led by a very charismatic african-american lead actor in this case it's david diggs and before i get into his a uh, little bit of his repertoire i should note that the director of this movie is carlos lopez estrada who i don't know if he's american or not but he has directed actually a number of short films and this is his feature film debut. Before this, he directed episodes of a show called Las Fantásticas Advent Adventuras de del Focus, which um, was in 2015, three episodes of that. He directed a number of short films, and this is actually a very strong debut by Mr. Estrada. And interestingly enough, the stars of this film, David Diggs and Rafael Casal, uh, wrote this film. So they, they fortunately um, enlisted a very um, good director to, to head this film for them. And this is also Rafael, Cas Rafael Casal's um, acting debut in a feature length movie as well. He's been in a couple of shorts and one TV miniseries, but this is his first film and it's a very good debut. David Diggs has had some more acting experience than his, his uh, co-star. He was actually really good in a movie last year called Wonder where he played the title characters, or I shouldn't say title characters, but the main characters fifth grade teacher, Mr. Brown and I kind of wish I had a, uh, a, a teacher like Mr. Brown when I was in school. That would have been great. But he's also been in a number of other films and TV shows. He had a recurring role in The Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt which is a great show, and also in the underrated Netflix series, The Get Down. So Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt is rated well. It's not overrated, but it's not underrated either. The Get Down is a show that really didn't get the attention that it deserved, despite being on Netflix. But I think maybe later it's going to get the attention that... Twin Peaks and other uh, Freaks and Geeks and other cancel shows like that get. But in any event... So David Diggs plays an Oakland native, Oakland, California, by the name of Colin, who is a guy who just recently got released from jail after a two-month stint. And for what you don't know when the movie begins, but it's revealed what got him in um, jail as, as the movie progresses. But he is sentenced after his two-month stint, to one-year probation, which means that he has to live in a halfway house, and he has to be in his apartment 
by 11 p.m. every night. And with three days left to go until he's off probation, he actually finds that he is struggling to get in at 11. And that particularly comes when he actually witnesses a black man get shot by a white police officer, and the black man is unarmed. Now, he's on his way home, but he's actually a few minutes late for his curfew. So therein lies a particular conflict. Does he report this um, this uh, unfair shooting? Uh, unfair is an understatement, but that's the best word I can come up with right now on the spot. And to whom does he report it? He obviously can't report it to the police because he saw the police shoot this guy. And if he reports it to anybody else, it will basically be admitting that he stayed out past his probationary period. So that's one of the subplots in this film, Blind Spotting, that actually takes on a lot of issues, particularly gentrification. In other words, Oakland is not the city that it used to be. It's not dangerous, but it's, it's experiencing a lot of hipsters that are moving in that may or may not make this place better for its community. And that certainly drives grinds the gears of Colin's friends Miles, who's played by Rafael Casal. And Rafael Casal is Hispanic in real life. I think in this movie he's supposed to be straight out white. And he he has grown up with Colin. They've grown up in the same neighborhood, so he's not exactly what you'd call a wigger. Um, in other words, a guy like Kevin Federline, who is a poser. He's, he's married to a black woman, he has a mixed-race child, and he also has uh, a temper that's probably even greater than um, Colin's. But it, th- there's also an issue of w- the perceived white privilege that may have kept Miles out of jail and put Colin in jail, even though they were involved in the same incident, which is elaborated upon later in the movie. So this movie reveals a lot as you're watching it. And to give you any more sense of the plot of this movie would be probably giving away a lot. But it's a movie that not only has some great acting in it and superb directing and editing, but it also raises a lot of issues about the changing state of America today and also issues that everyone is everyone of all races is facing right now. What's in the news, what's in our communities, and so on and so forth, while at the same time also being surprisingly funny in a number of instances. I love David Diggs in this movie. I've seen him in a number of other films and TV shows before, as I stated, but this is the movie where I finally know what his name is and I can properly place him. But it's a great acting debut, at least for a feature-length film from Rafael Casal, and this gets my rating of a knockout. I think it is a very impressive feature-length directorial debut for Carlos Lopez Estrada, and I also think that it deserves all the praise it gets, including the praise from me. But this is a movie that hasn't debuted pretty strong. It's only 23 at the box office this week, but I highly recommend seeing it. I wasn't prepared to be a caregiver to mom. I had no idea how hard it would be and what I would need to know. Things I never thought of, like how to improve her mood and ways for me to stay positive. Luckily, I found the Caregiving Resource Center from AARP. It had articles about the basics, but also information about the hurdles I was facing. Caregiving Resource Center at aarp.org slash caregiving. Articles, tips, and tools to help you both care for your loved one and care for yourself. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. So, usually I get into my next segment, which is what's coming up next. But before I do that, with as little time as I'm probably going to have, I just wanted to elaborate upon or discuss a, an issue that 
has been brought up in the the news a couple of days ago particularly that the oscars or the academy of motion picture arts and sciences is proposing another category that has proven to be somewhat controversial and that is the oscars because last year's uh, rather this past year's ceremony was the lowest rated in quite some time even though it was a very good show they want to present an oscar category for best popular film and of course that has invited a lot of controversy amongst the movie fans and also fans of the academy awards a lot of people have called it pandering which i actually agree with because i don't think the academy should reward films that are not up to a certain quality even if they are popular i mean the box office returns already kind of give those movies the recognition they deserve, don't they? I would never want to see a Transformers film, for instance, be nominated for Best Popular Film. So I think that invites a number of other interesting questions. Like, for instance, what constitutes the best popular film? Is it how much money it made? Is it its quality despite not being of quality of the other Best Picture nominees? Who knows? In fact, I had my doubts at the Academy Awards nominating a maximum of 10 um, nominees for Best Picture. I thought, where was the limit? But then again, the nominees used to be 10 until probably the 1950s, but then with the controversy of The Dark Knight not, not nominated for Best Picture in 2009, the Academy expanded and really haven't looked back because I thought that was a, a very smart move. And vicariously, some popular films have become nominated, like Toy Story 3, for instance, and deservedly so, I might add. So my opinion is that there shouldn't be a popular movie category, but I do take into account that at the first Academy Awards in 1929, there was there were actually two categories for Best Picture. There was best art picture and best feature picture but a lot has changed since 1929 obviously there weren't you know color films back then for instance but still i i think that they should stick to one best picture category maximum 10 nominees and maybe even i don't even think they should fix the nominee process i think i'm no expert on ratings but i do think that having another best picture category that's that's leaning into popular films will compromise the integrity of the academy of motion picture arts and sciences again i'm no rating expert i don't i'm a guy who will watch the academy awards no matter what no matter where i am but not every viewer is like that and it's not just the oscars that's struggling it's all shows that are struggling so i i think i've elaborated upon that enough let me get into a much shorter segment, What's Topping the Box Office. These, this is the spoken word preview of movies that are coming out this coming weekend. One of the big ones is Mile 22. It's about an elite American intelligence officer aided by a top-secret tactical command unit who tries to smuggle a mysterious police officer with sensitive information out of the country. This is directed by Peter Berg, and this is the third film he's directed starring Mark Wahlberg. It also co-stars Lauren Cohen from The Walking Dead, Ronda Rousey from UFC, and Peter Berg himself. So Peter Berg and Mark Wahlberg's collaborations have been hit or miss. Uh, Patriot's Day from two years ago was a slight miss, but still, this movie's not based on a true story, so it might actually be interesting. I, I was actually worried that Mile 22 would be about a marathon again, but I will see this movie, and I will let you know what I think when I review it for next week's show. Another movie I'm going to see, guaranteed, is going to be Crazy Rich Asians. This one is directed by John M. Chu, and it's about a native New Yorker whose name is Rachel Chu, probably no relation. She's played by Fresh Off the Boat's Constance Wu, who is on her way to Singapore to meet her boyfriend's family. And I guess the uh, boyfriend's family is crazy, filthy rich, <laughs> as the title of the film suggests. And while I don't watch much TV, I do catch an occasional episode of Fresh Off the Boat from time to time, and I love Constance Wu. She is a doll. 
Um, I think she's very funny. She's very pretty. And I think a movie career is waiting for her, and it's about time. So that's a movie I will see, and I'll review it for you for next week's show. But that just about does it with words on film for this week. Just as a reminder, the views and opinions expressed on this show are solely those of your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. I can't finish that. I'm just going to say this is Dan Burke saying I'll see you at the movies.